Welcome to Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. I'm Albert Berg, and I have no context to lead into your idea for this week, Tony. <laughs> You've said some words to me, and I do not know what they are. Lead on, Macduff. Today, we're going to be talking about Eugene Shefflin and Shakespeare's birds. Yeah, you said that, but I don't know what that means. <laughs> oh, yeah, you gotta let me keep going. Okay, okay. <laughs> Essentially, this starts out as someone taking fandom a little bit too far. Eugene Shefflin is one of those people that just, he, once he gets into something, he gets into it. He was in love with the plays of William Shakespeare and decided on a romantic notion that he would release every bird referenced in the Bard's plays into New York City. Okay. So, Shakespeare often used birds for dramatic effect. He used nightingales as an expression of love in Romeo and Juliet. In Macbeth and King Lear, he used owls to express screeches in the night. There's just a whole bunch of them. Skylarks, all sorts of different birds uh, inside of all of his work. More than 60 of them were actually mentioned. And in 1890, Shefflin released 60 Sternus vulgaris, also known as European starlings, in New York City as part of the American Acclimatization Society. The group's charter explained its goal was to introduce such foreign varieties of animal and vegetable kingdom as may be useful or interesting. It was also founded to give some comfort and familiarity to European immigrants. Okay, I haven't read the rest of what's going to happen, but I just happen to know from general knowledge that sometimes introducing a species that isn't from a place into a new place can uh, greatly imbalance the environment, Tony. Yeah, that's that's pretty much where this is going, especially whenever you get a really hardy species. Most like hogs. Of the, hogs yeah. are the big one that I know about. Europeans brought them over, thought it was cool. They took over everything. We're still fighting them, Tony. Yeah, if you go to Texas, you can pretty much kill as many hogs as you want. Parts of California, all sorts of places. You don't even need a permit. They're that, like, they're that ubiquitous. But, uh... As Al was saying, like, this is sort of a thing where you don't want to introduce species on a romantic notion. You might, like, if they're going to introduce a species, it has to have a very specific purpose. And the problem with starlings is that they are very, very hardy birds. They can survive in almost any type of environment. They nest, they adjust, they do really well, and they're very good scavenging type birds. They kill a lot of uh, insects and things like that, so it's not all bad. The problem is that they breed a little bit too much. This particular species was only mentioned once in all of Shakespeare's work in Henry IV. Uh, Hotspur is in rebellion against the king and is thinking of ways to torment him. In Act One, he fantasizes about teaching a starling to say Mortimer, one of the king's enemies, like just over and over and over again, kind of like a Nevermore type situation. Uh, he says, Nay, I'll have a starling shall be taught to speak nothing but Mortimer to give him uh, to keep his anger still in motion. And, like, it's just, it's. Probably not even that important to the play overall, but it's just one mention that got him interested in bringing these European starlings over. Might have seemed innocent enough, but starlings and sparrows are some of the biggest bastards of the bird world. As someone who grew up watching birds, I can attest, or with parents who watch birds, I can attest to this. They are really fascinating birds, too. They're kind of, like, they look black under most light, but whenever you get them in the sunlight, their iridescent sort of color changes. They get a lot of green and purple on them, and... Like, they've got speckled wings, just a really interesting-looking small bird, about six inches long for the biggest ones. They're about the size of a fist, really, for the body. I'm looking at a picture that you've included in the document here, and I, I, I imagine they don't all look this beautiful, but this bird is a beautiful bird. Yeah, they actually, like, the, most of them look about like that. Some are a little bit, like, chubbier and, like, less... Uh, less well posed than that for the pictures I was looking at, but that is, that is generally what you're getting with a starling. Maybe there, those of you who are watching the YouTube video get to see this. Yeah, it's going to be on the, the, audio it's gonna be on the thumbnail. Yeah, just Google European Starling, but it'll be in the thumbnail as well for the YouTube video. Uh, they're interesting birds because they're kind of fearless, too. They like to tempt fate by dive-bombing other birds, cats, some hawks, and any other animal they might perceive as a threat. They'll, like, literally have a swarm go over uh, these birds and just dive-bomb at them. They're not quite as effective as, like, grackles or blackbirds whenever they're trying to go after hawks, but it's still interesting to see them kind of coordinate to try to scare off these, uh, these other animals. And some hawks have actually taken to being some of the only predators that they have other than just like house cats going after birds but there's so many of them that it really doesn't matter 
I like this the idea that they all band together into one group to sort of make their small size punch a little harder. Yeah, and that's a for a starling or for starlings. It's actually called a mur. Uh, let's see, is it a murmur? It's a, for starlings. It's actually called a murmuration of starlings because of the sound that it makes whenever it's going over. And anytime you see like a giant mass of uh, birds swarming on the horizon, usually like I like a lot of people think of the scene from True Detective where they're kind of like just moving around, like undulating, and you see the eye appear and all that stuff. But like if you see that in a movie, in a film, or just in real life, those are most likely European star because sometimes they'll move in packs where it's multiple thousands of birds. A lot of them don't migrate, but the ones that do, like uh, at this place near my parents' house in Sunna Lake, you'll have 20,000 birds in the trees right there. I just have to mention for the benefit of the YouTube comments that Albert knows that a group of birds is called a flock. Yes. And not a pack. <laughs> Did I actually put pack in here? <laughs> you, said, you, you said that they move in packs. Yes, flocks. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, save your comments. Actually, give your comments because those help us. Yeah, those, that's fine. <laughs> so in the Shakespeare quote that you mentioned, uh, he talked about teaching this bird to say things. I assume that they can mimic human speech. They can. Uh, they, they've they been known to mimic a lot of different things. Like in the wild, you might hear like a car alarm in the woods because... <laughs> They just like they they like to pick up on certain things. Uh, they they don't have a huge vocabulary a vocabulary. It's not like a parrot or something like that. But they can also mock other birds. So if you hear like a, a chickadee or something like that, which has a very uh, a very unique call, it actually sounds like they're saying chickadee dee dee. Like whenever they're calling out, like a starling would be able to mimic that. Okay. So the like like I said, they're really cool little birds, and I can understand why people would like them like in theory but they just completely took over like in future episodes of bad ideas we'll no doubt cover the impact of introducing foreign species into an ecosystem but the impact in the united states is profound the show ozark clued me in on this particular bad idea there was a small subplot in which one of the kids of the show buys a gun and after seeing a documentary about starlings asks if he can just go kill them there's actually a lot of websites that give you like a point system for killing starlings like, uh, they consider a male two points, a fledgling three points, and a female 11 points, because if you kill a female, it usually stops 11 birds from being created. There are a lot of people who are virulently against starlings. Like, I, I didn't realize how bad it was until I started researching this, but there are, like, entire societies just bent on destroying starling populations. Why? What, what's, their, what's their beef with these guys again? <laughs> well, starlings breed very quickly, and that's the bad idea here. What started out as a mere 60 birds plus a supplemental 40 later in the year has grown into 200 million birds in the U.S., and they are birds that absolutely devastate crops. The USDA estimates that this costs farmers more than $1 billion per year in losses. That's bird... a lot of number of dollars. Yeah, that's a lot for just one invasive species. And uh, a lot of times they uh, they target fruit trees and grain crops. They get into all sorts of agriculture products as well. They're they're picky eaters in some ways. Like uh, in that if there's like they're going to pick through the food that's there to get the best of the grains, and they're known for going to feedlots and dairies and just picking through all the all the feed for the cattle, eating the best grains, and then flying off, which is actually uh, badly affected dairy yields too. Yeah. Yeah, so like the the dairy cows aren't getting the nutrition that they need because they've put a certain mixture of grains together to try to help milk production, but the birds are coming in, which also means that a lot of these cows are probably also eating nasty uh, starling crap, which also carries toxoplasmosis, among many other things. There's more than a dozen uh, different diseases that these birds carry, uh, a lot of which are similar to ticks. The problem has gotten so bad that they are no longer a protected species here. Like, you could literally go into your backyard with a pellet gun and just shoot as many as you want, and there's nothing anybody can do about it because, like, they are just that big of a nuisance. Along with house swallows uh, and a few other uh, invasive European species, you can just take them out at will. The USDA itself exterminated more than 1.5 million in 2012 alone. It's believed that it had no real impact on the ecosystem because they are such prolific breeders. One of the other biggest problems that they pose to uh, to humans is in airfields. Like, 
bird strikes are one of the worst things that can happen to an airplane during takeoff. There have been many times where, like, geese or things like that, the bigger birds will get in an engine and actually cause a plane crash or cause the plane to be grounded for a significant amount of time. In 1960, a plane went through a flock of starlings and actually brought down the entire plane, killing 62 people. Between 1990 and 2001, the FAA reported more than 850 instances of engine damage caused by starlings alone. So what are we what are we doing about this? I mean, you mentioned the hunting and stuff. Is there a way to to get rid of these things? Uh, mostly it's through very, very persistent hunting, like in in certain areas, especially with populations of woodpeckers or various other uh, hole nesting birds, because that's mainly what they target. They look for like holes in trees and they will go and they will just literally peck to death the birds that are in there and then take over their nest. And yeah. So, like, in a lot of areas, you have very concentrated hunting efforts, but trying to get the overall population down is kind of a fool's errand. There are a lot of things that people have done, like they've made specific poisons that are more susceptible to killing gulls and uh, and starlings more than other mammals, but there's still some bleed over from that that can cause adverse environmental effects. Just to recap for people, the beginning of this whole problem is one dude who liked Shakespeare... And for a little pet project, because he had a lot of time on his hands, he decided he was going to release every single bird mentioned in Shakespeare's play into the wild in America. Yes, exactly. One guy, Eugene Shefflin, decided that his pet project was more important than anything else. And he I'm may sure not have known, yeah, he but didn't know still... how big it was going to be. But it's still one thing where it's like, yeah, he might have thought, oh, cool, New York City will get some of these birds. And whenever I see them, I'll think back to Henry IV. And instead, it's just something that's actually taken over most of North America. You can find them in Mexico all the way up to Alaska. I was wondering, do we know if he completed the project with the other birds? He did. He actually released all 60 different breeds, and most of them died horribly. <laughs> I am looking at his Wikipedia page now, and it says his attempts to introduce bullfinches, calfinches, nightingales, and skylarks were not successful. Yeah, you've, you've got some that actually have thrived, like cormorants and, and various others, uh, and those haven't had the same type of environmental impact. And like uh, those have, have kind of filled filled in their own niches in different uh, ecosystems here. I'm sure they're still considered an uh, invasive species, but some of them are so commonplace that it's just they're they're not really causing a problem anymore. There are some other things that I didn't get into that they have tried to do to lower the population of starlings. In uh, Washington, D.C., uh, the White House and the U.S. Capitol were getting covered in them, so they actually placed a bunch of electrified wires around the U.S. Capitol building. And because birds are actually pretty smart, it only took a few days to figure out where they could and couldn't land, so they just did that. And one of the different things that they tried to do during the Depression was the U.S. government released recipes for starling meat pies. Which, considering how small these birds are, that's a lot of work to get a little tiny bit of meat. Yeah, I, I do like the sort of creativity of that, though. The idea that... You outsource it, especially because people are hungry at the time, and say, hey, here's how we make these things taste good, and also try to deal with your problem of overpopulation of starlings. Yeah. Killing... Especially whenever you're in the middle of the Dust Bowl, and, like, the starlings have to be herding crops that actually are growing. Yes. I have another picture of a starling here on Wikipedia, and they're beautiful. I have never seen one of these birds. They're the most common like bird in North America. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've never <laughs> looked at a bird that looked like this before. We've got, well, like, some stupid pigeons and hawks and stuff around where I live. <laughs> hawks are awesome. I'm not knocking hawks. I'm just <laughs> saying, uh, now that I see how colorful these are, I want one. You actually probably could get one and raise one. Like, uh, my mom, in her, uh, in her naivete towards this problem, has always rescued birds, and we actually had a few starlings growing up. Like, once my iguana died, we had this giant tank, and she just started rescuing some birds and putting them in there. So we raised some starlings from falling out of the nest and resuscitated them and put them back into the <laughs> environment. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the twist ending, the bad idea was Tony's bad idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those like if you think about it, like say that was three starlings, two of them were female, like that could have been 22 there. That could have been like just the number of birds that could have come from those ones is actually pretty huge. It's staggering. Yeah. 
Uh, it's summed up best by the Pacific Standard. I kept trying to think of a way to say this originally, but we're just going to quote them. Though Shefflin couldn't have known that he was unlatching Pandora's box that cold winter morning in Central Park more than a century ago, the ramifications of his well-intentioned and incredibly ill-conceived gesture uh, to the bard continue to this day. In a way, it's a fitting tribute to the famous myth Beth line Shakespeare penned 400 years ago. What's done cannot be undone. Really, this is all Shakespeare's thought fault. Yeah, think if you would have just picked like another type of bird or something that we have over here, I'm the actually... one mention, the one mention of Starling, so you could see him hundred years ago, like hovering with his editor's pen. Do I really need to have Starlings in here? And he left it. <laughs> could have had parrots, Shakespeare. Yeah, we could have had macaws everywhere. <laughs> Anyway, I think that's all we have on this particular uh, on this particular topic. I was trying to find more on Eugene Shefflin, but there wasn't a whole lot on his personal life other than he was part of this society. So, Another one of these guys that does something stupid, and that's all anybody remembers about him. Yep. <laughs> his impact might be actually bigger than most of the people that we've talked about for having stupid ideas. It's not quite Mao, but it's definitely affected some lives. A billion dollars in losses to farming profits is is pretty big i would say yeah <laughs> anyway that'll do it for bad ideas this week thank you all for listening if you enjoy this check out our patreon page patreon.com slash human echoes for two dollars a month you can support us five dollars a month gets you pins and all sorts of other stuff two dollars gets you postcards christmas cards there's a lot of cool stuff that we put out there so check out patreon.com slash human echoes also you can watch this on youtube and catch all of our other content that we cover movies games all sorts of stuff you should really check it out we'll see you again next week with more bad ideas bye bye